Great, thank you. Beautiful. Well, what a great introduction. Um, I actually myself was so shocked with what we were doing in Language Magazine in the 70s that I never talked to myself again after that. I broke away. <laughs> it was disgraceful. Um, so it's great to be here in Victoria and uh, at the home of Chax Press and the incredible Dalkey Archives Press and Kyle Schlesinger, who I work with the Buffalo and his cuneiform American Book Review, uh, Simcope. I mean, so many just great things. It's hard to believe they're all here. And uh, when I went to that bookstore, I was like stunned. It's the crystal chamber of uh, North American publishing in that room. Uh, and it's uh, unbelievable when somebody can find a way to support alternative, small, uh, non-profit, and even anti-profit publishing. Uh, I hope I don't say something that's too troubling there. Anti-profit. Anti-profit is what happens with people involved with poetry who lose money for so long that they take what was a terrible and disturbing thing and they try to say that they're proud of it. <laughs> when they've given up <laughs> on even breaking even. Um, well, one thing that uh, was a delightful thing in my life as a poet was this small book that uh, Charles Alexander published with uh, Cynthia uh, Cover uh, in 2003. So I thought I'd read a few poems from Let's Just Say, also in honor of the new book that uh, Chax Press has published. Uh, of a collaboration that I did with Ted Greenwald. And so I'll read the, uh, all, all of these poems were included in Girly Man. It was the larger book which I incorporated them and then also some of them, including this one, in my selected poems, All the Whiskey in Heaven. Uh, this one, it'll come up later with a, a more recent poem is called Thank You for Saying Thank You, and uh, Charles alluded to this poem. This is a totally accessible poem. There is nothing in this poem that is in any way difficult to understand. All the words are simple and to the point. There are no new concepts, no theories, no ideas to confuse you. This poem has no intellectual pretensions. It is purely emotional. It fully expresses the feelings of the author. My feelings. The person speaking to you now. It is all about communication, heart to heart. This poem appreciates and values you as a reader. It celebrates the triumph of the human imagination amidst pitfalls and calamities. This poem has 90 lines, 269 words, and more syllables than I have time to count. Each line, word, and syllable have been chosen to convey only the intended meaning and nothing more. This poem abjures obscurity an enigma. There is nothing hidden. A hundred readers would each read the poem in an identical manner and derive the same message from it. This poem, like all good poems, tells a story in a direct style that never leaves the reader guessing, while at times expressing bitterness, anger, resentment, xenophobia, and hints of racism. Its ultimate mood is affirmative. It finds joy even in those spiteful moments of life that it shares with you. This poem represents the hope for a poetry that doesn't turn its back on the audience, that doesn't think it's better than the reader, that is committed to poetry as a popular form, like kite flying and fly fishing. This poem belongs to no school, has no dogma, it follows no fashion. It says just what it says. It's real.
And this one, also quoted by Charles, is called Let's Just Say. Let's just say that every time you fall, you never hit the ground. Let's just say that even when the day ends, the night refuses to come. Let's just say that if all else fails you, at least you can count on that. Let's just say that a bird in the fist is better than a bird and a fist. Let's just say that if chance accords possibility, melancholy postpones insomnia. Let's just say that sleep is the darker side of dreams. Let's just say that sometimes a rose is just a red flower. Let's just say that every step forward is also a step nowhere. Let's just say that the thirst for knowledge can only be quenched if one learns how to remain hungry. Let's just say that green is always a reflection of the idea of green. Let's just say that I encounter myself not in the mirror, but in the manure. Let's just say that each door leads to another door. Let's just say that we think it before we see it, or better, we see it as we think it. Let's just say a stone's throw might be a world away. Let's just say that love is neither here nor there. Let's just say that the girl is the mother of the woman. Let's just say that without disorder, there can be no harmony. Let's just say that the aim is not to win, but not to lose too bad. Let's just say that a knife in the back is better than a knife in the heart. Let's just say that between sleep and dreams is the reality behind reality. Let's just say that I am very weak and want to take a bath. Let's just say that the truth is somewhere between us. Let's just say the top of a tower is not a good place to hide. Let's just say that mankind suffers its language. Let's just say that a bird cannot always be in flight. Let's just say that we're not far from where we would have been if we had lived better lives. Let's just say that pretty ugly is an aspiring oxymoron. Let's just say that if the sun is a rock burning in space, then the earth is a shard hurtling from its designation. Let's just say that little is gained when nothing is lost. Let's just say that the lie of the mind is the light of perception. And the last poem in this small uh, book is, goes like this. Every lake has a house, and every house has a stove, and every stove has a pot, and every pot has a lid, and every lid has a handle, and every handle has a stem, and every stem has an edge, and every edge has a lining, and every lining has a margin, and every margin has a slit, and every slit has a slope, and every slope has a sum, and every sum has a factor, and every factor has a face, and every face has a thought, and every thought has a trap, and every trap has a door, and every door has a frame, and every frame has a roof, and every roof has a house, and every house has a lake. <laughs> Cynthia asked for that one. OK, so this uh, poem is called, Thank You for Saying You're Welcome. And it has an epigraph from Rambeau. 
un bateau frail comme un papillon de mai, a frail boat, a butterfly of May, like a butterfly of May. This is a totally inaccessible poem. Each word, phrase, and line has been designed to puzzle you, its reader, and to test whether you're intellectual enough, well-read, or discerning enough to fully appreciate this poem. This poem has been written for an audience of poets Poets who know the difference between the simple past tense and has been, the present perfect tense, and who also recognize the possible aesthetic effect of that difference. Poets who also know that has been has another meaning, even though that other meaning is not relevant to this poem. This poem is unnecessarily complicated, flailing wildly like an opium addict looking vainly for its pipe at a demonstrably deranged aversion of the necessary in quest of the improbable. Necessity is to this poem what margarine is to marzipan. This poem cries out for an audience that is able to savor the use of a single quotation mark where less sensitive readers would fail to see why double quotes weren't used. And might even be so foolish to think that using single quotes was a mistake or pretentious. This poem has been written not for just any other poets, but for those special ones capable of appreciating the nuances and tricks, prosody and infrastructure, or their absence. In this poem, this poem fancies poetry as an eidetic emanation so rare and so refined that it will elude even the most elite readers, which almost certainly does not and will never include you. <laughs> its attitude toward you as a general reader is that you'd be better off watching BBC News <laughs> or listening to NPR human interest programming or anyway sticking to the laureates. This poem appeals to a small coterie of those in the know by making in-group references <laughs> that will leave you scratching your head if your head ever frees itself from scratching your ass. <laughs> this poem is laced as tea is laced with arsenic, but also as lace is made in Chantilly, with coded winks to beret-clad cognoscenti, sly references such as the fact that the title of this poem refers to another poem, which is never referenced in this poem, <laughs> or not referenced in a way the broad public would be hip enough to be hip to. Dig it? So hey, if you're not hip to that other poem, you will be as out to see with this poem as the proverbial organ grinder who lost his monkey. Not in the great storm raging, always raging outside, but in the headier storm, raging, raging like a god who's lost his sheep. Or a millinery salesman who's lost his samples. In the supernal storm raging inside the organ grinder's mind. And speaking of the title of this poem, as we have been doing, we if, but only if, gainst all good judgment, <laughs> you have accepted this poem's insouciant solicitation. Have you noticed, careful readers surely woulda, that the title of this poem, thank you, 
for saying you're welcome seems to bear no relation to the text that follows. <laughs> this imparts this poem with an extra shot of aura, at least for those clever enough to appreciate the conceit. But leaving aside whether or not the, tape, the title is connected to the poem, the title does make an acute social observation that nowadays nobody wants to accept gratitude. They want to bestow it, but not receive it. Thank you for writing this poem. No, not at all. I must thank you <laughs> for reading it. This poem believes that poetry's highest, this poem believes that poetry's a higher calling. For this reason, this poem can't be bothered with the emotions and cares tragedies and celebrations, torments and elations, worries and ministrations, preference and aversions, spites and likes of ordinary people like you. The common man, but also common woman and child, irregardless of whether gay, straight, mixed, or can't, or won't, or would prefer not to be categorized, because who cares about such categories except a bunch of bigots? and whose business is it anyway? This poem has been forced with leaden heart and downturned brow. If such an expression of supervening regret does not, though I fear it most assuredly does, lapse into personifications, this poem has been forced against its every aesthetic hope to turn its back on you, the reader, who is, come on, Let's stop kidding ourselves, a Philistine, stupid, ignorant, and vulgar, possessing a limited vocabulary, if possessing any vocabulary at all, and not simply cruising it. A reader who, mon Dieu, doesn't even know French. <laughs> this poem is not the Costco kind supersized and discounted. It's a tough love that doesn't coddle or treat you like an idiot, even if thou art one or aspire to be. Aesthetic stupidity is not born, but made. A poem is a place to think, not say, as in a game of mouse and cat, who said and read are both the mouse keeping the cat at bay. Dearest, most beloved reader, for despite the impression I have hitherto conveyed, know that you are always and will always be foremost in my heart. Beware the dark mysteries of this poem. For if, even for a moment, you, use, you lose your vigilant disapprobation and let the poem's insidious charms grab hold of you by your bootstraps and shake you to an inch of your life, then its black magic will fuck with your head and commandeer your soul. Stay calm, keep your distance, be sure to neither cry nor laugh. Because when you do, poetry's boogeyman will have trapped you in her lair. And there's no known escape from that, nor unknown either. The poem possesses a nearly absolute knowledge, a virtual supreme truth that it discloses only to a blessed few. This poem's address is to eternity and to those in the now and here, and the hidden places in between, who choose of their own accord, out of desire, vision, and with a leap of faith bordering on apostasy, to countenance and revere it. It's unreal.
This poem is from Recalculating. It's called On Election Day. I hear democracy weep on election day. The streets are filled with brokered promise on election day. The miscreants vote same as saints on election day. The dead unleash their fury on election day. My brother crushed in sorrow on election day. The sister does her washing on election day. Slowly I approach the voices dark on election day. The men prepare for dying on election day. The morning hush defends its brood on election day. So still, so kindly faltering on election day. On election day, the cats take tea with the marmoset. On election day, the mother refuses her milk. On election day, the frogs croak so fiercely, you think that Mars had fallen into Earth. On election day, the Iron Man meets her frozen gasp. The air is putrid, red, interpolating, quixotic, torpid, vulnerable. On election day, your eyes slide on election day. Still, the mourners mourn, the weepers wept, the children sleep alone in bed on election day. No doubt a comet came to see me, fiery and irreconciled, torrid, stummed on election day. On election day, the trespass of the fatuous alarm and ignominious aspiration fell the golden leap to girdled crest. The tyrant becomes prince on election day. Neither friend nor foe, fear nor fate on election day. The liar lies with the lamb on election day. The last shall be the first, and the first sent to the back of the line on election day. The beggar made a king on election day. Let him who is without my poems be assassinated on election day. Let he who has not sinned, let him sin on election day. The ghosts wear suits on election day. On election day, sulfur smells like beer. On election day, the minister quakes in fear. On election day, the Pole and the Jew dance the foxtrot. On election day, the shoe does not fit the foot. The bullet misfires in its pistol. The hungry raider reels before steadying himself on facts. The grid does not gird the fiddler on election day. Galoshes and tears on election day. The sperm cannot find the egg on election day. The drumbeat becomes birdsong on election day. I feel like a nightmare is ending, but can't wake up on election day. So I, I wrote that on uh, November 2008, the day that uh, President Obama was elected. Here's a very short one called Confederate Battle Flag. Selling loose cigarettes, changing lanes in duress, aren't warrant for arrest, much less sudden death. I had to read this, uh, hesitated for a second, but this is my translation of De Earl Kona, the very famous Goethe poem, Elf King. Some of you may know the setting of it um, by many composers, but very famous uh, Schubert leader. So this is a translation of this Goethe poem. Who rides so late through a night so wild? It is the father with his dearest child. 
His daughter cradled in his one arm free. He holds her tight to keep her from harm. My child, why is your face covered in fear? Look, father, do you not see Elf King near? Elf King leering with a crown and a tail. My child, all that is is a passing gale. My dear sweet daughter, come along with me. Your dress up games we will play by the sea. Such castles we'll build when we get to the shore. You'll wear grandmother's hats you so adore. My father, my father, don't you hear what Elf King's whispering in my ear? Be calm, stay quiet, oh my dear sweetest one. It's just the leaves blowing in the wind. My daughter, my daughter, with me please stay. Your brother waits to sing the night away. Your brother will take your hand in his hands and dance with you gaily on glistening sands. My father, my father, do you not see Elf King's sons beckoning madly to me? My daughter, my daughter, I see it well, the old willow shimmering in the dell. I love you, your beauty's pure perfection. From my clutches you have no protection. My father, my father, I'm in his grip. Elf kings dragged me to his demon ship. The father shudders, rides hard through the wild, clinging for life to his dear, aching child hurtling onward, overcoming his dread, in his arms home now. His daughter is dead. So I'll read two uh, more final short uh, poems. This one is called Trambui. Not by train nor by foot, not by starlight's fleet of beams, not by way of forest nor by candlelight's flickering charm did I come to you or lose you, but by my own wild stumbling. And then the last poem I'll read is the title poem from my selected poems called All the Whiskey in Heaven. Not for all the whiskey in heaven, not for all the flies in Vermont, not for all the tears in the basement, not for a million trips to Mars, not if you paid me in diamonds, not if you paid me in pearls, not if you gave me your pinky ring, not if you gave me your curls, not for all the fire in hell, not for all the blue in the sky, not for an empire of my own, not even for peace of mind. No, never, I'll never stop loving you, not till my heart beats its last. And even then, in my words and my songs, I will love you all over again.